Michael Vonnen. Welcome to the Tolkien Lore Channel. I'm the Tolkien Geek. And as you can tell, since I've finished the Silmarillion synopsis series, I've pretty much given up on being serious and slipped into complete and utter clickbait. I take that back. This title is not exactly clickbait. It is, but it's not. So obviously the whole issue of Tom Bombadil's identity is a topic that has created a huge amount of debate among the Middle Earth loving community for a long time. And while I do think the answer is kind of right under our nose, it still doesn't really answer the question that everybody really wants to know, but the answer sparks a bigger conversation about a different topic, which I think is really, really interesting. So, well, I'll just save that for later, but let's get started. So the launching point for this video is the conversation that Bombadil has with Frodo when they're staying with Bombadil at his house, and Frodo at one point just in complete wonder and awe at what and who Bombadil is asks him who are you and Bombadil turns to him and says don't you know my name yet that's the only answer who are you alone and nameless and this reading this not too long ago it occurred to me how profound a thought that is and there's several aspects and dimensions to this that I want to explore in this video and the main starting point on my train of thought was, if you think about it, that's, that's really true. If you didn't have a name, how would you identify yourself? How would you, you know, set yourself apart from everybody else in the world? And so the one aspect of this that I want to explore is the idea of, you know, you as a person as opposed to anybody else as a person. And that gets into the idea of, names as important aspects of our identity in our lives. And that's, you know, there's there's a lot of different aspects to that, but one that I think is rather interesting is the idea of how important names are, you know, to us, and not just in American culture, not just in any given culture, but in practically every culture. Names are really important. And one of the reasons for that is obviously the identity aspect and you can look at how names were used in the past to get an idea of how that worked. For example, a lot of last names that we have now are old leftovers from last names that were derived from either your profession or where you were from or something like that. For example, the last name Carpenter. That person's ancestors were probably you know, carpenters in their family for a long time, and that's how they got the last name Carpenter. Or, you know, you might have been known as John from such and such town, and maybe that town made its way into the last name. Or, you know, there's Scottish clans or Irish clans, various different ways in which names become used to identify yourself as opposed to other people. And we can see this kind of usage in Tolkien's works as well. For example, Frodo will occasionally introduce himself as Frodo, son of Drogo. I don't know that there's any other Frodos that he needs to distinguish himself from, but it's a way of making sure that we're talking about this particular Frodo as opposed to maybe some other Frodo. And Aragorn does the same in a few occasions. He says, I am Aragorn, son of Arathorn. So there's this idea that names can end up being a very unique identifying thing, and of course in a world especially our world now with 7 billion people on the planet, it becomes more and more important to have, you know, names that really help identify you. I mean, some names are so common, you can run into thousands of them just within a given city if, you know, if you're in a big enough city. So that's one aspect, but it's not the most interesting aspect to me. One extra part of this, though, is the idea of identity, and this gets really metaphysical, but have you ever had one of those dreams where you know somebody in the dream, like say you're dreaming about a sibling or your spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend or, you know, whatever it is, somebody that you know really well, but they don't look the same. There's something different about them. I had a dream like this not too long ago, and this is part of the reason this made it into this video is that the ideas coalesced, but if you think about it, how do you know that person is who they are? I mean, in the dream, you just know. And you just, you know, for whatever reason, you just know. And there's something about that. There is something about a given individual that you know 
this is that person. But you still, you know, names are basically how we identify. So like in the dream I had, you know, I was dreaming about, I want to say it was my wife. It's been a while since I had the dream and dreams tend to fade. But, you know, I gave that person my wife's name and it was my wife, but it definitely did not look like, like my wife. So it's like, how do I know that that's who it is? There's something about people as individuals that we know that they have an individual identity that we attach a name to, and that name is how we associate them with the identity. For example, if you change your name, that, you know, like if you go into witness protection and have to change your name, that can be really strange. You have to get used to being called something different. If somebody randomly calls your name in, say, a supermarket and, you know, they're talking to somebody else, but your immediate response is to respond to that as if they're talking to you. And, and you know, I mean, there's just so many ways in which our names are connected to our identities in important ways. But what about other aspects of names and how they play into things? One of the other aspects of names is kind of connected to what I was saying about how we use last names and things like that to identify professions and things of that nature. There's an old, old Latin saying, which I ran across completely randomly, but it turned out to be useful. So the, the saying is nomen est omen, and it basically means your name is your destiny. And the idea is your name conveys something significant about who you are or who you will become or what you will do or something like that. And if you think about it, that seems really strange. And in English, we tend to have a harder time with this probably because in English, our language is such an amalgam of Anglo-Saxon and Norman French and various different languages that a lot of what names mean has kind of dropped out of our conscious mind. But Almost every name that you can think of actually has an actual meaning, like a standard word. And this is a lot more obvious if you look at really old cultures. Like if you look at um, names in the Bible, for instance, all of them have names. And many of them are extremely significant, either in terms of the person's story arc or something. And sometimes God will give somebody a new name to indicate some change in their station or something like that. You know, there's, and Tolkien, of course, being a Catholic, would have been well familiar with this and maybe even familiar with the idea of that Latin saying that nomen est omen. And you can kind of see that play out in some of his works as well, where, for instance, you've got, and it's not always predictive necessarily, sometimes it's literally just descriptive. For instance, you can see um, in the Silmarillion, you've got the character Beleg Cuthalion and it's, sometimes he's called Beleg Strongbow. And that's actually, Kuthalion is just a literal translation of Strongbow. Bow is Ku, Thalion is strong. Um, and you'll even see Hurin referred to as Hurin Thalion. Basically, Hurin the Strong is the idea. But Beleg, the name Beleg, also means something. It means the great or big or something like that. And you can tell because the great sea in the West is Belegire. Ire being the, the root word for sea or, you know, really large body of water. Beleg just means great. So Beleg Kuthalian literally just translates to great strongbow. And it's not really as explicit in the Silmarillion, but if you look at some of Tolkien's earlier writings on uh, the Turin Turumbar story, where you get Beleg in, as a character pretty heavily, it'll actually refer to his bow, which only he has the strength to pull. So his name actually means something really significant about him as a person. Similarly, Feanor means spirit of fire, and that turns out to be both kind of descriptive and predictive in a lot of ways. Uh, for instance, when he's born, his spirit is so strong that his mother in giving birth just basically exhausts herself to death. So in a way, that's kind of descriptive, but it's also predictive in the sense that Feanor becomes a very hot-headed, fiery personality as well, and we can see that play out in a lot of ways, even up to his death, where when he dies, his spirit is so fiery that it consumes his body on its way out before it goes to the halls of Mondos. So there's a bit of a combination there of description and, pre and prediction, which you can see in other instances if you really 
pay attention. Like a lot of Tolkien's names are purely descriptive. You can see that in a lot of cases where, for example, Ungoliant means gloom weaver, and she spins webs of shadow. So, I mean, literally, that's just what she is. That's what Ungoliant is. She's a gloom weaver. That's, you know. So, a lot of them are really purely descriptive, but you do occasionally get the predictive elements. And sometimes these names can be kind of a double-edged thing, too. So, for example, Saruman, his elvish name is Kurunir, and it basically means a crafty man. Crafty in the sense of, you know, very good with crafting things with his hands. But it also kind of has that double meaning that we're familiar with in English of being sly, sneaky, and that sort of thing. And it turns out Saruman is both crafty in the original sense and in the sly sneaky sense and so there's not only a predictive element to that name but also a double entendre to that name as well and you can tell that Tolkien has a lot of fun if you pay attention to the names with all these different aspects of how names get used and how they mean things for different characters now, not all of them mean things because some of them are just taken from, you know, Norse or other uh, legends. So, I mean, like the, the 13 dwarves in The Hobbit, their names are literally just taken out of, uh, if I remember correctly, it was the Edda, the Norse Edda. I may be misremembering that, but they're just taken wholesale from a different culture's legends. That's what they are. But a lot of his elvish names that he actually makes up himself and even some of the other ones that aren't Elvish. I think Frodo is actually from either Norse or related language meaning wise, but it's been a long time since I ran across that, so I may be wrong there. But most of his Elvish names, and I mentioned some of these as we went through the Silmarillion, uh, a lot of names of places as well will just translate to something really basic, like Belagost, the city of the dwarves, just means great city. Beleg, great, ost, city. And you can see that root, Ost in a lot of other places, like Osgiliath. Osgiliath basically just means city of star host or stars. The Liath ending there is just kind of an idea of a great plural, you know, not just two. And Gil means star, Gilgalad, starlight. Again, you can find this in all kinds of different ways, but the point is, Tolkien obviously put a great amount of thought into naming people, giving them names with significance, and you can see connections between that and how names play out in other cultures where we have names that, you know, really mean something. And in connection with this, another accidental discovery that, that happened that really plays into this video, my wife recently told me about an uh, article she read in Parents Magazine while she was waiting in a doctor's office. And the article was basically pointing out how names seem to actually have an effect on how our children grow up. And one of the examples was people with the name Dennis or something similar are overrepresented in the dental field. Dennis, dentistry, you can see a connection there. Uh, and you've got, you know, so I mean, that kind of reminds us of the issue of Carpenter being a last name because you were a carpenter and you just became known as John the Carpenter, John Carpenter, and then Carpenter becomes a family name. Here it operates kind of in reverse. And there's other ways, too. There was, there was an interesting connection of boys with gender, gender, amb, gender ambiguous names actually have bigger problems with disciplinary issues as they're growing up, which seems kind of odd. There, I'm not sure what the connection there would be, but there are apparently statistics done on this where you can actually see that names have an effect on how kids grow up. And that's, it's really weird. It's not like mysticism or anything, but it is certainly interesting that, I mean, you could put, for example, the dentist and dentistry thing down to just the subconscious connection of the root word din and din, and that's just what people end up doing because it just seems to fit them very well. But Either way, it's really fascinating that names actually do seem to have, if not predictive, at least influential effect on how we live our lives. And that's, you know, I don't necessarily think Tolkien knew about that, but certainly there is that element in older legends and histories and 
you can't help but think that he at least took that element of it. And that is really fascinating, but it's also really fascinating to think that it's actually true in our humdrum day-to-day -day lives. But one final aspect that I want to bring up in regard to this connection of the idea of names and identity, Tolkien, being a linguist, of course, was very well aware of the meanings of words from different languages and how, you know, they could be used in different ways. But he also had a humorous side to him. And, you know, it's not surprising that somebody with his um, skill would be able to pull off a lot of interesting jokes, and he did. For example, one of the uh, one of the more significant ones that I can think of is all of the kings, or at least almost all of the kings of Rohan, their names mean either king or leader or ruler or something similar such that basically they're essentially all king, 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 king. He's done other things outside the realm of the Lord of the Rings where he does similar types of linguistic jokes. For example, and I don't really, I can't find a good source for what all the jokes are, but in the story of Farmer Giles um, and the dragon, uh, Farmer Giles of Ham is the actual name of the story, apparently that thing is littered with linguistic jokes and uh, jokes about names of places in England, such that, you know, you would either have to have a source to actually read through to find the jokes, like an annotated version of the book, or you know, be just an expert in the in the field to know what he's joking about. But this is the kind of thing Tolkien did. He, he you know, he intentionally inserts jokes in places, or even if they're not always jokes, they're at least, you know, things that if you know enough, you're going to pick up on and go, well, that's a curious little Easter egg. But it's not even just that. Tolkien was famous, well, maybe not famous, but one of the things that makes Tolkien a really interesting person in the way that he thinks about language is the fact that, you know, he developed most of his mythology around the language. He built the language first and then built the mythology to explain the language, essentially. And he developed his own languages because he had this very strong, innate sense of this sound or sound group ought to go with this meaning. So, I mean, it's he has this idea that a particular sound fits a meaning particularly well. And that's, you know, Tolkien is not the only person to have been this way. There are other people who have done similar things. But that is what makes Tolkien's world really unique is because it's all built around this idea. And so... Again, if you really start to pay attention to the names, you'll notice things, you know, about how different words mean different things, and you can even kind of pick up on it yourself. Like, even if you've never you know, read any of Lord of the Rings, you hear the word Mordor, and that's bound to make you think something unpleasant. You know what I mean? And it literally just means the Black Land, which is an unpleasant idea. Um... It's purely descriptive, almost, because, I mean, it's literally just referring to the fact that it's all ash and dust and just, you know, because of the, the Mount Doom is just basically rendered it a wasteland that looks black, basically. So it's just descriptive, but it also, again, taking on that double entendre, it's black because Sauron lives there and it's evil, too. So, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of different meanings that go into each different word that Tolkien picks. And there's this idea you know, Tolkien had about names fitting certain, you know, words fitting certain meanings very well, and some of them, to most people, I think, will come through, like the Mordor example. Maybe not every time. We might not think necessarily that Beleg means great necessarily. That may not sound right to some people, but to a certain extent, there is that idea that some things just kind of sound right, and that brings me kind of full circle because going back to, you know, a name, every now and then you'll get an idea from a name about what somebody might look like or what they might sound like, or in reverse, you might see somebody or hear their voice and think that sounds like a, you know, and, and sometimes you'll actually be right about that. You'll like be able to connect an idea or you'll even just see somebody and they'll tell you their name and you can be like, you don't look like a 
you know, a John or a whatever the name is. You know, there's there's this idea that we can kind of figure out what somebody should be like based on their name. And isn't it weird that we think like that? I mean, that's really bizarre, but I mean, it's kind of in all of us to a degree. And I think Tolkien just had it to a much greater degree than most of us do. But, you know, coming around full circle, it's just really fascinating how this one little comment by Tom Bombadil about your name being who you are and how that fits into so many different aspects of not just Tolkien's work, but how things really are in the real world. I don't know if Tolkien was thinking about that sub, you know, in, in his conscious mind, but if he, if he was, it was genius, and if he wasn't, it was genius on a different level. I mean, either way, I think it's just really interesting how, with that one little line, Tom Bombadil kind of starts a huge conversation about any number of different things that we could go off on. And I've just touched on kind of the, the general ideas that I've worked out over, you know, the several weeks since I had this idea and based on a few things that have come in since, like the Parents Magazine article and whatnot. But I'm sure there's a lot more that could be said about this. And, you know, I'd love to hear anybody else's thoughts on what they think about these topics and other ways that we could take Tom Mamadil's comment in different directions. But that's basically what I wanted to talk about here in this video, so I'll go ahead and wrap up. Ha, uh, you only thought this was total clickbait. The original point that I was going to make about Tom Bombadil and his identity, which I didn't cover earlier, uh, is the idea that Tom Bombadil tells Frodo that his name is the only answer. Now that tells us a number of things. It tells us he's not Iluvatar, because if Tom Bombadil was the only answer, then you couldn't also answer Iluvatar. You couldn't also answer Manwe or something else. You know, quite apart from all the other interesting discussion that we've just been through, Tom Bombadil is telling us that Tom Bombadil is just Tom Bombadil. Whatever he is, he's one of a kind, he's unique, he's not anything else we've seen before. So Tom Bombadil's identity has been revealed in this little quote, and his identity is just Tom Bombadil. So, I hope you enjoyed that video. It is definitely a different type of video than what I typically do, but I just thought it was so mind-blowingly interesting the ways that you can think about all these different things and thought it was worth sharing. So, if you enjoyed it too, please do give it a thumbs up and please do share it around. If you want to subscribe to the channel, you can do that here. Don't forget to click that bell icon. You can support the channel over here and you can find two of my previous videos here. And of course, you can follow me on Twitter for some Tolkien trivia questions at JRRT Lore. Until next time, I'm the Tolkien Geek signing out for the Tolkien Lore channel. Namariye.